Yeah, so my story starts, um, it was a while ago, it was January of 2003, uh, and in that year we were spending a year in Oslo, in Norway, um, a whole year all the way through the winter, and most of, we had a, a baby with us, or a one-year-old, and most of my memories of that year, um, of course it's very cold and dark, and you have to put the baby into the snowsuit and the snow boots on, and then you have to carry the baby and the pushchair down the several flights of stairs, and then you have to force the pushchair through the deep snow, because they don't shovel their walks in Oslo, any Americans in the audience, uh, they don't shovel their walks, it's kind of crazy. So that was the main thing, but on this occasion, um, that I'm remembering now, I uh, didn't have the family with me, I was walking, going to walk to work at 9 o'clock, so everyone thinks it's going to be dark all the time, but the sun does come up, and before it comes up, it skirts along just below the horizon for quite a long time, so you have a very long, um, what is that? Is that the dawn, or is that before the dawn? It's not dusk, this is the morning time. There's a long something. So the, the, the street is dark and the buildings are dark and the sky is starting to get light and it's, it's, you know, the, the sky is clear, it's quite beautiful. And I looked up, because um, most of us are looking down to not fall over on the ice, but I looked up and there was this unbelievable thing in the sky, this enormous thing. I was just completely amazed. Uh, it was sort of glowing and um, I, had no, I knew immediately that I had no idea what this was. I had never seen or heard of anything like this before. It was sort of huge and glowing and enormously far away and uh, had all these amazing, vivid, iridescent colours in it. Um, it was just completely amazing. So I was, uh, didn't know what it was. Um, so of course when I got to work, everybody was talking about it. Everybody, a lot of people had seen it. So it turns out it's, this, it's, a, it's a cloud. It's this new type of cloud. It's called a mother of pearl cloud. And in all the thousands of years of history, in all the continents, Nobody had ever re reported seeing such a cloud until the first time it was seen, it was in 1870 in uh, Sweden, in fact, in the far north. So it turns out this kind of cloud is, in fact, caused by climate change, as I read in the newspaper the next day. And Cammy said, you're not allowed to prop, but I gave her the little photograph of this cloud. So if you look on the Facebook page for this event, then you can see the actual cloud that I saw that morning. Um, so what's happening there is, because of global warming, all the heat is being trapped on the ground and can't escape into space. So the upper atmosphere where this cloud was living is getting colder. And at some point, first in 1870, it got so cold up there that tiny ice crystals could form. And that's the origin of these mother of pearl clouds. So that was, that was, a, that was an experience. That was 2003. Um, but I think... Somehow, actually, I can't remember exactly, but I know for some years I had been gradually getting more and more interested in climate change. It was kind of gradual and it grew and grew. One thing that happened was in 1998, that was when I discovered that this whole thing of global warming through burning fossil fuels had actually been dis discovered in 1898 by a Swedish scientist. And I remember that I had never heard of this before. And I was, it was in 1998 and I was going around telling people about it. That's why I can remember it today. Uh, another time was 2007, when there was a dramatic collapse of the ice in the, in the North Pole, which people had been thinking might be happening through the 21st century, but they were, certainly weren't expecting it to spectacularly uh, disappear in 2007. That was another key event. So little by little, this thing that sort of crept up on me, it started sort of like an interest and then hobby, and then I started learning more and more about it, and it was quite an experience. It just started getting more and more sort of interesting and sort of grew and grew because it sort of seemed to encompass everything, right? Got all this physics and chemistry. I was kind of remembering my high school physics, um, how the global warming works, uh, all the air currents and the ocean currents, and, uh, and then it's going to affect us. It's going to affect agriculture and food and um, basically everything. And so it affects politics and democracy and how society, how society is going to react and... Um, as I went through this uh, sort of journey, it just seemed to get more and more important uh, to me anyway, uh, and of course to other people as well, but uh, more and more important and sort of all-encompassing. So maybe I can in fact bring the word love into the story because it was kind of like reconnecting with this sense of global sense of the whole world, how it all fits together, 
Everything seemed to be related to everything else. That seemed to wonder about the whole world. And in fact, um, so that was quite a strong experience, and I was, uh, didn't really put, discover anything new in the course of this, but what happened was, it all seemed to get more and more sort of stronger feeling, right? So certain basic uh, parts about this whole problem of uh, climate change, and in particular, why it's been so difficult for, uh, for society to respond properly, they just struck me with greater and greater force as time went on, and I was describing this feeling to a friend in the States, and he said to me, I think what you're describing there is called education. Um, how about to this point, I'm a mathematician, as I, was, I said in the introduction, and in maths it's really all about understanding things, and that's what I've been doing for myself, trying to understand what on earth was going on here. And also in our teaching, right, Tammy? We, goal is for the students to understand the material, that's what we would like to be able to do. And then when you, in your research, when you prove a theorem, then the, the point of proving it is then you understand the result that you're talking about. Not actually about doing anything. So, up to this point, I hadn't really done anything. So the next part of the story, well, it's a bit embarrassing because um, one of the events that made me want to, act, well, not want to, but actually make the change to actually start trying to do something about it was when our family, we, in 2016, we bought this electric car. So it's embarrassing to me because I've always kind of thought of myself as really not materialistic at all. In fact, I was just recalling earlier, when I was a boy and we would ask our parents for something, then my dad would always say, no, you can't have it, because in our family we have no further materialistic ambitions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that really rubbed, I think it did in fact rub off, maybe just by saying it over and over, it rubbed off. So I do, in fact, I still think of myself in that way, but on this occasion, it, was, it took us 18 months to make this decision in our family to actually buy this car, take this step, which was a little bit new and I'm not an early adopter of anything. And then when we did do it, it was so easy. I just sent an email, and then a few weeks later, the car arrived in our driveway, and it was like this piece of magic transported from the future to completely change our lives, just like that. I, almost, I just could not believe it. So then I thought, well, that was easy. It could be easy for other people too. In fact, it could be easy for everybody. We could actually solve this very easily. It was really quite a transformative experience. So that was when I started, um, yeah, really stepping out a little bit, trying to change the world, and then I immediately discovered, it turns out it's very difficult to change the world. <laughs> but that was also quite a valuable lesson, right? Which I hadn't fully, fully appreciated until that point. But I'm not giving up. This is where I, the fact that I'm not allowed to use notes, I've forgotten the next part of my story. <laughs> anyway, so we're going along. Um, so what have I learned from all of this? It started in Norway, didn't it, the story? I had, uh, had a great uh, respect for Norway, and um, it was sort of like, when we went to Norway, it was sort of like an idealised version of how I sort of remembered New Zealand. Of course, when you're growing up in a place, you have a sort of a false, unrealistic, idealised view of it, and Norway is a bit like that. So it's, it's full of pristine wilderness, and it's full of very fit, happy healthy people that all have nice long holidays all the time. It's basically sort of marvellous. Uh, and what Norway has done, which you may well know about already, is they've just, uh, they're basically far and away the world leader in electric cars. So now half of all the cars sold in Norway are electric. And that's all happened in the last three or four years. And that's a small country. It's got the same population as New Zealand. It's got very similar political disputes that go on in New Zealand and in any other countries. So they've really just transformed themselves and they're going to be the first country in the world to completely stop burning fossil fuels, which is what we have to do. So I think that's where I can end my story. Um, thank you to Norway and thank you to those, those, very, uh, those mother of pearl clouds that I saw that day. Thank you. <laughs>